we'll be back for the TTF. Uh, now I think we have EI motor with a tobacco clean on. I'd like to thank the council for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, I'm Eli Boner. I'm a South student at Southeast Missouri State University, as well as an intern for the Preventing Tobacco Addiction Foundation. So we know in our community we have a problem right now. Across the nation, 95% of current smokers start before the age of 21. Once they get you hooked then, you're basically going to be hooked for life more than likely. Having your first cigarette by the time you turn 18 makes you twice as long likely to be a lifelong smoker. One in four high school students across the country have used an e-cigarette in the past month, and that number is only increasing by the year. Here in Cape, we found that one in six retailers sold to a youth under the age of 18 years old. The average initiation age across the country is 13, but here in Cape, it's lower at 12 years old. E-cigarettes are really driving this issue in Cape, we know that in the 2018 National Youth Tobacco Survey, there was a 78% increase in e-cigarette use among high school students between 2017 and 2018. Among middle schoolers, we saw around a 50% increase the same time frame. And what's really sad about this is that we've been seeing, seeing traditional tobacco products like cigarette, their use go down so much, but then all of a sudden e-cigarettes have come in and started increasing the market share of people that are using them. So we're seeing youth that have for a long time we're not using any form of tobacco products, suddenly using a product now. And this is just a graph about in 2018, three, over three million students across the country were using some form of an e-cigarette. And that number is just exponentially growing year after year. So I know this is really hard to read, but the number on the e-cigarette category, around 27.5% of youth across the country used an e-cigarette in 2019. So the number keeps going up year after year, and one of the things that's driving that is the fact that there's flavors. So you can get almost any flavor you want. There's over 15,000 flavors on the market today that you can get to put in your e-cigarette. The biggest flavors that kids are using today are fruit and menthol. So the flavors that, you know, they use in their everyday life, candy flavors, any flavor you want, you can get it with that 15,000 number. So why is this happening? You know, why are kids getting hooked to this? Brain development is going to be continuing in youth until they're 25 years old. This affects your decision making, your impulse control, your sensation shaking, and especially the peer pressure that you feel as a kid. The brains of our youth here in Cape are very vulnerable to an addiction like this. You know, nicotine is a drug. It's a stimulant. It's highly addictive. And it's going to cause changes in your brain chemistry. And if you're doing it before you're 25, there is permanent damage that is severe that is done to your brain and your development that cannot be fixed no matter what you do throughout the rest of your life. So in 2009, Congress passed the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act. What this did is created a federal age of 18 across the board and also gave states the authority to pass stronger regulations. At the same time, it also asked the FDA to commission a study that was done by the Institute of Medicine to study what raising the legal sale edge of tobacco products to 19, 21, and 25 would do. They found that raising the sale age to 21 would have the best effect at reducing initiation among kids. The 15 to 17 year old age range would see a 25% reduction in initiation by simply raising the AOS sage. The first place in the country to pass this policy was in Needham, Massachusetts back in 2005. So Needham on that map you can see it's a suburb surrounded by a bunch of little other cities. So kids that go to school there can literally walk across the street to buy a tobacco product. But within five years, Needham found that in their high schools, they saw a 50% reduction in youth using tobacco products. Neighboring areas only saw around a 17% reduction. That is a noticeable difference by simply raising the age of sale in your local community up to 21. Why is this, why does this work? You know, what makes it raising the sale edge work so well? We know that a majority of tobacco products that youth come into contact to were given to them by one of their peers. So when you're a high school student, 13, 14, 15 years old, and you're at school and you have friends that are 18 that can legally go after school and buy a vape, buy cigarettes, they can bring it to you and give it to you because you're their friends. You know, 
How many high schools are interacting with a 21-year-old on a daily basis that they go to school at? None. There's no 21-year-olds in a high school. Tobacco 21, an idea whose time has come. You know, in the past few years, we've just seen this policy take off. Back when I started this a few years back, there was virtually no states that had this as a law. We were in like the 200s, 300s with cities that had done it. And today, we're at over 500 cities and counties that have done it in different, 30 different states, as well as 18 statewide policies. And here in the heartland, we've seen states like Texas, Arkansas, Illinois, and Ohio pass it. And locally in Missouri, we've had around 22 communities pass it that covers around 42% of the population in Missouri and over 50% of the population across the country with the sale age of tobacco products is now at 21 years old. So when we look at Chicago and California, Oregon, we see that there are noticeable decreases in usage and people that are picking up the product to begin with by simply raising the sale age. When you look at public polling on this issue, 70% of the nation supports it. When you break it down to how strongly they feel about it, 50% of the nation strongly is in favor of this proposal. <clears throat> Across, if you've been a smoker, former smoker, or a current smoker, every group strongly agrees this is the best way to protect our kids. When you look at people, different age ranges, every age range supports it. And I really like to look at the ages 45 to 64 and 65 plus, because these people grew up seeing what smoking does to their friends that they live with. You know, and they don't want another generation to be hooked by this product, a product that kills 50% of its users. You know, we, and here at Cape, we really value small businesses. You know, that's really a cornerstone of Cape. I enjoy so many of the businesses that we have here. Going after them. There's so many unique opportunities, and you know, that's really a big concern that people often have is, you know, this could affect our small businesses. But I think we need to look at the effects that having an employee that smokes has. $6,000 more a year on average it costs to have an employee that smokes than doesn't smoke. You know, by raising the sale age to 21, we would have a whole new generation that would not be smokers that would help businesses save money. And as I said, another common argument against is if you're 21, you should be able to smoke. Because you know, if you can be 18 and go to war or vote, why not smoke? Well, alcohol is at 21. Marijuana is at 21 places, it's legal. You have to be 21 to be a city council member. You have to be 25 to rent a car, 21 to check into a lot of hotels. So there's clearly an imperative for industry and for government to pass common sense regulations that would protect our kids. In the past, when this policy has happened locally in Missouri, the main opposition we always see is from the e-cigarette industry because they know this is taking a bite at their core market, which is our kids. You know, that's who they market to. That's who they're trying to get hooked on these products. You know, this is not the kind of marketing that they use on our kids. This is e-juice. This is Those are all how they market to our kids to get them hooked to these products by giving them things that look like things they like to use on their day-to-day -day basis and then put them in that and be like, oh, it's safe. Nothing's wrong with that. It's just like the other things you use. We have to put flavors in there for you to see you like a lot. And I think the big offender here is the Juul devices. You know, they look just like a flash drive. You plug them in just like a flash drive to charge them. Easy to sneak them anywhere you want to go. And as I said, they don't, Juuls deliver nicotine at a rate similar to a cigarette. Where it's the dark blue line on that graph there, that's what a common other e-cigarette product will deliver it at. But the Juul instantly gives you that spike of nicotine just like a traditional cigarette does. So it's easier to get hooked on it and it's harder to stop. And Juul has really taken off in their market share. The numbers I've seen recently, about 80% of the market share riding around there. Just a few years ago, Juul didn't exist. They really capitalized on this. You know, they market to our kids in so many different ways. I was just reading an article today that talked about how Juul is investing money in our schools. They are spending hundreds thousands of dollars for health camps where they'll sponsor events where they have spokespeople for Juul come in to talk to kids. There was one ninth grader that reported when their teacher walked out of the class, the representative for Juul started talking about how the product is safe, nothing wrong with it, a ninth grader. They came into their classroom and told them that this product is safe. They are directly marketing towards our kids and preying upon them. 
So a common thing along a lot of e-cigarettes companies is that, oh, we don't have nicotine in our product. There's nothing addictive about it. The products are not currently regulated by the FDA, so there's no way to prove that. So the CDC has done some testing on it, and they found that across the board, 99% of any type of e-cigarette product, any flavor, has some level of nicotine to get the kids hooked on the product. You know, this isn't a mistake. It's not the e-cigarette companies giving out free nicotine because they just want to. They know that's how they're going to hook the kids on the product. So we've had many organizations across the country partner together to write a model policy of how we can tackle this crisis. Organizations like the American Heart Association, American Lung Association, they've all agreed upon common language that we know is best model policy to move forward with protect our kids. <clears throat> so some of the components of this include defining what a tobacco product is, including e-cigarettes in that definition, making sure the sale age is at 21 so that we're not punishing and criminalizing our children for falling prey to the predatory marketing of industries like fuel. Making sure that there's age verification when at the point of sale. Proper signage. Enforcement. Making sure the penalty is on the retailer. We don't want to punish our kids. We need to punish people that are selling to our kids and hooking them on this product. We all, and along with this, just making sure that we know that when we put puff laws, which is purchase, use, and possession, so when we're criminalizing kids, they are much less effective at stopping kids from using than when we make sure the retailers won't sell it to them. You can get fined and come back and buy again, but if a business gets a fine for selling to a kid, they're probably going to stop doing it. So here in Cape, we know that of the 18-year-olds alive in the city limits today, if this policy was passed, 200 of them throughout their lifetime are not going to die from a preventable disease caused by a tobacco simply by raising the sale age to 21, because they're not going to ever initiate, they're not going to become a lifelong user of the product that kills 50% of its users. When we work locally in Missouri, we see that we have a broad coalition of many different kinds of business groups, veteran groups, public health organizations, that all come together to say, this is best, best for our community. You know, anywhere we've done this in Missouri, we've always had really broad group that's come together and say, this is what's right for us to protect our kids. Jules caught on to this. You know, they play a very dirty game. And they'll run advertisements now saying they want to raise the age to purchase tobacco to 21. Well, when we talk about the purchase age, that means they want to criminalize the kids. So what they're saying is, okay, we marketed towards these kids with these 1,500 influencers that we've paid to do online social media ads to market towards the kids, and now we're going to punish the kids for falling prey to that. They market directly towards our kids, and then ask the kids to be punished for falling prey to them. So here in 2019, we see a statewide policy movement in 12 states that have passed it statewide out of the 18 of the policies we have across the nation now. 83 cities this year alone have passed it out of the over 500 that we have across the nation. And looking forward to federally, we know there's Tobacco 21 bills at the federal level now as well. So this is getting attention at all levels of governance. This isn't news to the tobacco industry. They've known for a long time that if they couldn't market and sell people between the ages of 18 to 21, that a lot of their market share is never going to become their market share because people are never going to start. They've known this all along, and they continue their practices because they know what's in it for them, money. That's what our lives are worth to them. Thank you, Eli. So I'm Jenny Chavik. I'm with the Preventing Tobacco Addiction Foundation. Um, as Eli mentioned, our organization runs the Tobacco 21 website. And you know, we've worked across the country. I was on the Columbia, Missouri City Council when we adopted the policy, and that's how I got involved in it. So Columbia was the 32nd city in the nation, um, so Missouri was the fifth place to have a local policy. And Missouri has been leading the way um, since then. Uh, we have some of the cheapest tobacco in the country, right? We have the lowest sales tax on tobacco at 17 cents a pack. And what happens with that is that it makes it very easily accessible to our kids, and then 
I don't know how many of you have actually seen a jewel pod, but I'm going to go ahead and pass this around. Um, so, as you mentioned, you know, it really looks like a thumb drive, and you just um, plug it into your computer so it charges just like a USB. And when they first came out, you know, students were actually charging them on their computers, and teachers didn't know what they were, right? They thought that they were a thumb drive. And each pod, so each jewel pod, contains as much nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes. And kids are reporting that they're going through 2 to 14 pods per week, or 2 to 14 packs of cigarettes. Again, these have an entire pack of cigarettes worth of nicotine. And, you know, people often ask me, well, how many hits are in the jewel? The kids call them hits. And so there's about 200 hits. But with a traditional pack of cigarettes, you couldn't just take the thing down, right? It would burn the back of your throat. But Juul is unique. It's cured with a benzic acid, and so it numbs the back of the throat, and it doesn't, it doesn't burn. So you can take it down. Kids have reported they can take down an entire pod in an hour. Uh, that's mint. As Eli mentioned, mint is now one of the most popular flavors among the kids because you can still buy mint in the brick-and-mortar store. Um, I went and purchased the jewel and the pod across the street from the middle, the junior high school. Wait, what was the name of the junior high school? Cape Central Junior High. School. Cape Central Junior High. So each pod cost four dollars a pod. So you can buy the whole four pack for fifteen ninety nine. Um, so you know it's cheap and accessible, and it's right close to our kids. So during this presentation, I've been wearing this watch. You know, a lot of us wear smart watches these days. And just to show you how conniving the e-cigarette industry can be, this watch is actually an e-cigarette. This watch, we'll just pop the button right here. Comes off. That's where you inhale. And there's juice in it. So kids can basically take this to school wear it like a regular watch, pop it off when they need to take a hit on it, and most people wouldn't even notice. The industry has been making these devices to be very deceptive, right? We have hoodies that the string actually is the vape device. Um, it's just amazing. A pen, ink pens, markers that look like ink pens or markers that are really um, vape devices. I have a a junior in high school and a freshman in college, and I often apologize to them. I, I say, you know, this cohort of kids is going to be the most addicted kids that we have seen in many generations. And it is up to us as adults to take action and make policy at a local, a state, and a federal level to really protect these kids from the industry. If I have any this is alarming. Yeah. This to me is, is, is really alarming. I uh, just to make a couple of statements. First, you guys did it. This is a great presentation. You did a very fantastic job. Um, and I've always, I, I think this is, oh, sorry. Sorry about that, guys. Um, no, no. Uh, just so, every day I walk into work and there's a person that has previously walked into academic hall that smokes uh, some sort of a, of a vape pen that is cotton candy flavored. And it smells exactly like cotton candy it, it, to the point, and it lingers in the air to the point where it smells circusy. I mean, there, there's, there's just something. And so that to me is a perfect example of, of that is that deceptive marketing. Cotton candy flavored nicotine. Uh, that, that is deception. And then you throw into this, I've never touched a, 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 a jewel before. Um, that is, is, that watch is remarkably deceptive. Uh, it, it does make you, you sort of fear for what these students are, are being pressured upon at school. You know, you, you didn't have to charge a regular cigarette. That didn't get plugged in. But like she was saying, it, it's remarkable to hear if there is a calming property that allows you to, uh, to continue smoking when ordinarily a regular cigarette would have, would have physiologically kept you from going forward, 
it, it just is all very alarming. And I, I think this is something the city of Cape should consider. It's, uh, I have never seen the beginning <coughs> before, but it just makes you wonder how many of those kids have a device like that they can use at school and just take it off and use it while they're at school. And just speaking from personal experience at college, the amount of students that have these kinds of devices in class with them and use them in class, it's, it's overwhelming. You know, kids can sit in class with a jewel placed in their hand, and no one else will probably see it unless you're directly watching. And the amount of, I would say, smoke that a jewel gives off is so little that you have to be staring at them the whole time to even notice that they've taken a hit off of it, because they can just blow it into their hand and it'll just disappear and they'll never even see it. People use these things in class constantly, walking around, and no one notices. There's really, it's so hard for people to step in and say something about it because it's very easy to hide it. I know oftentimes I think we say, you know, the parents need to be holding their kids accountable and, and keeping an eye on what their kids are doing, but it's really hard given the deception that the industry has provided for these kids, you know, to get away with it. And so we, we need to do everything we can to, to regulate and hold the industry back. I want to thank you guys and, and recognize it as an exceptional presentation. And um, as someone that is, I'm all for the rights of small businesses and their ability to run their business um, and not be heavily regulated, but uh, uh, there's something wrong with them profiteering off of the backs of the health of our youth. And as a healthcare provider that sees the downstream ramifications of tobacco use in way too many patients, and then not only that, but the downstream effects of healthcare economics that it costs to take care of them, I think any way uh, that we can prevent that lifetime smoker is a, is a good step forward. And I, I also commend your efforts statewide and nation nationwide. And I also, I mean, it's a bipartisan effort, both at the state level and at the federal level, in my understanding. Yeah. Um, and I, I would like to see Kate carry forward with something like this, too. Anybody else? I just have a question about uh, enforcement. Uh, I don't know how much you know about that, but uh, maybe at Columbia. Uh, do they do, uh, you know, with alcohol, we, we do like sting operations uh, using our uh, our police operations. Do they do, or are they dependent entirely upon uh, complaints, or how, how, how do they do enforcement with the, uh, the retail establishment? Yeah, good. thanks for asking that question. It's an important one. So um, locally, we do do um, underage decoy buy attempts at each retailer annually to make sure that those retailers are being held accountable. So Missouri is one of 12 states that we don't have retail licensing at a statewide level. And so it's really important to make sure, and you have a local license in Cape Girardeau, to, but to make sure that those licenses are up to date and that all the retailers who are selling not only just cigarette products, which is what most of us cities had license for, but all nicotine products to make sure you're capturing those vape shops. So to make sure your license in the city are current, and then to do those underage decoy buys to see if they're selling. We see that um, for retailers, they build a fine into the cost of doing business, so they just pass that on, that nothing gets their attention like a suspension revocation for repeat violations. So we typically say if you're doing um, one or two decoy buy attempts at each retailer per year, that you'll suspend or revoke the license like say three or seven days after the second violation or the third violation. How many strikes of selling to an underage kid do they get before they're out, right? So really to put in that suspension revocation as a part of the licensing scheme for a penalty for selling to making an illegal sell to our kids. Question. Um, I don't know if it was really mentioned there. And um, does this cover all forms of smokeless tobacco as well? Yeah, tobacco? all tobacco products. And you know, we're happy to help you to modify your definition section to make sure that it encompasses all existing and new products that the industry can be created creating because they're clever, right? And so we want to make sure that we're encompassing all products, with or without 
I mean, because now they have a synthetic nicotine, right? So we have a comprehensive definition of the Public Health Law Center, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, and our organization has all come together to um, create with our legal counsels. Any other questions? Great presentation. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Back him up. Appreciate it. Can we, can we make comments or ask questions? I will allow that. Okay, great. As a former smoker, although I did not do cigarettes, I did cigars and pipes. Um, <clears throat> I want to make it. Well, Would first you identify all, yourself first? David Atkins. Okay, thank you. Name no further. Yes. And address? 133 East Cape Rock Drive. As a former smoker, I disagree with smoking. I think the age should be 21. I have no problem with that. The problem that I have is we must remember that these are not cigarettes. They're not cigarettes. There's no burning and the inhalation of dozens and dozens of nasty chemicals like there are with cigarettes and pipes and cigars, especially cigarettes. Number two, okay, number two, the misuse of many of your facts that you've had up here when you're combining them, cigarettes and E, and, and it looks like you need to get your facts straight and clear and make it very clear. This is cigarettes, this is e-juice. So you're making people feel, oh, these are as bad as cigarettes. They're not. They're as addictive, but they're not as harmful to your health. Trust me, I know this. Number three, follow the money. As it is now, there is no state and no federal taxes other than regular sales tax. There is on liquor, there is on tobacco. If we can make these e-cigarettes a sin, then we can impose a sin tax. You older fellows know what I'm talking about. Sin tax. Booze, cigarettes, yachts. These things have sin taxes. E-cigarettes do not. So right now the federal government and the state government only makes sales tax off of them. But if we can tax them because they're really nasty, then they can make more money off them. Follow the money. Thousands of people who smoke, who used to smoke, got off of killing cigarettes that were killing them due to e-juice and e-cigarettes, which are no longer killing them. Yes, they're still addicted. I can't disagree with that. But they're not dying because they're inhaling tobacco. And through four, Businesses always, always do whatever they can to hook us, whether it's McDonald's and their french fries with way too much salt, or Dunkin' Donuts with their frappuccino and their high calorie, lots of sugar, um, iced coffees. If a business can't get us hooked, then they're not doing a good job. So to make it sound like e-cigarettes and Juul are the only people who are doing this, oh, they're preying on our sensitivities. Yes, they are. And so is every other company. Yeah, I think you, you know, those are definitely common concerns and arguments that we hear. So I'll address them. And the idea that there's not harmful chemicals, like the same as a cigarette, um, I, I think that right now in local media, national media, we're seeing we have over 1,080 um, serious respiratory illnesses that have been caused by an e-cigarette device. And, and I think we're also hearing in media that you know that's a lot of THC that's causing that. So we know that one out of every four users is just exclusively nicotine. Um, we also know, based on CDC testing, that although in smaller quantities, all of the carcinogenic chemicals that we found in traditional combustible cigarettes are in the e-cigarettes. Uh, I'm happy to provide you the research and studies on that. We didn't have a slide on that. 
but we do have slides on that. Um, we, we know that they're less harmful, right? That e-cigarettes are less harmful. We'll never claim that they're not. But we also have to say that when 50% of the users of cigarettes are going to die, then our standard for less harmful isn't very high, right? <laughs> and so we have now 18 um, vape reported deaths across the country in the last month, right? Um, it's happened in the state of Missouri. We had our first vape related death at Mercy Hospital in St. Louis County. Um, these numbers, there's, there's about a thousand vape related serious illnesses that we're waiting to diagnose right now. They're from multiple different causes. So we know that there's chemicals that are in it. We know that there's a lipid pneumonia. I'm not gonna get into the real science and technicality right now. I'm happy if you wanna have one-on-one -on -one conversations. These are not harmless. They may be a harm reduction for those who are already using nicotine, but for every one adult who is a smoker who transitions to exclusively a vape device, we have 81 youth joining into the nicotine and tobacco market through these devices. And so we want to make sure they're still accessible to adults who are long-term smokers, but we need to make them not accessible to our kids to get hooked. My point is that that should be the drive. I think the drive is to make them not accessible to kids. That's yes. That's the purpose. Yep. And that's the purpose. But we don't have to don't have to make them a sin in order to do that. We just have to be logical and sensible, like we are with alcohol and tobacco. It does it. Any other council have anything you want to add? I think uh, uh, I too like the idea of not exposing our kids to tobacco. Uh, again, I'm not a health care provider and I see it constantly. I know how it retards healing, I know how it does all sorts of things. And uh, I just uh, maybe like to just see staff do an investigation into uh, the whole ordinance issue and see what they come up with. Yeah, we'll look at um, their suggestion about the ordinance and uh, see how that might uh, play out for us and also the enforcement of it, I think, is, is uh, one of the things we want to look at. Uh, uh, if we just pass something and don't have a have wherewithal to, to enforce it, then we really kind of got it. So, right. yeah, we'll, we'll look into that. Bring the corporation. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Are there any uh, appearances?